Good morning, Journey friends and family. We are so glad that you've decided to join us here this morning for our online service. We would love for you to share the journey experience with a friend or a loved one. Would you share your faith and the link to this service with someone right now and invite them to come along on the journey with you? As always, we invite you to be interactive with us throughout our live service. If you're joining with us on our Journey website or on Facebook or even on YouTube, you do have the ability to interact with each other in the chat panel to share how this message is impacting you in real time. We look forward to seeing you in those chat panels. We also look forward to seeing all of your selfies. Guys, please take a selfie while you're watching service today. And please post them on Journey of HV on Facebook or on Instagram. We look forward to seeing your faces. Just a quick reminder, Wednesday night Bible studies, virtual Bible studies at 7 p.m. For more information on how to join, please text to church the word Bible study. One word, no spaces. Then you will receive instructions on how to join us there, and we definitely hope to see you. Also, don't forget about our corporate prayer sessions. Please text to church the word corporate prayer. Again, one word, no spaces, corporate prayer. And you will be sent everything you need to jump into those prayer sessions and join us there. Again, we look forward to seeing you. Please send your prayer requests and your praise reports by texting to church the word prayer. And family, please know that Pastor Peter and I are praying for you and praying with you in this time. The Journey Church continues to be busy within our community. A big thank you to all of those who have been volunteering their services at the food pantry distribution, donating truck rentals for delivery. Also a big shout out to Michael Flowers and our praise and worship team who are working out this virtual worship experience with excellence. What a great job. We're so grateful for you. Freddie McFuco making us look so good on live stream. We are getting better better and better every single week. We appreciate you so very much. We continue to receive questions on how to use the text to church function for donations while we can't meet locally. Please text the word give to the text to church number. That number again is 845-320-4483. Now by texting the word give to that number, you will be sent a secure link which will lead you through a few steps for setup. If you have any questions or any concerns, please do not hesitate to email or call the church and we'd be so happy to help you through that. Look, we don't need to tell you the needs continue to be great. Please continue to keep each other, our community, and our leaders lifted in prayer. Pastor and I continue to miss you all so very much. God bless you and keep you until we get to see you again. When night has fallen, when fear is coming, still you're calling me. When faith is lost, my hope exhausted, still you'll be my strength. When my mind says I'm not good enough, God, you're enough for me. I decide. You won't give up on me You won't give up on me Your love is holding on And it won't let go
let Hakim be lifted up. Let Hakim be lifted up. Let Hakim be lifted up. Nothing compares to you. Nothing compares to you, Jesus. No one compares to you. King of kings, the Lord of lords, the creator of the universe. Let our king be lifted up. Oh, oh, oh No one else can take your place. Oh, say All right, Journey Church family, it's time to quiet your hearts and your minds for the Word of God. Pastor Peter Jones is coming to deliver a word that is going to empower you, uplift you, and encourage you in your spirit today and help you to draw closer to God so that you can know who you are in Him and who He is to you. Welcome Journey Online Community. We are delighted you decided to join us here this morning. We know that it's not by mistake or accident that you are with us here today, but because God has a special word for you. So we are delighted that you have joined. Today, we're going to launch into a brand new series called Waiting Room. And for some of you, your anxiety just increased because you've been there before, whether it's in a dentist's office, while you're sitting there waiting, hearing the grinding sound of someone else's teeth, and you're sitting there with anxiety, uh, waiting to go in when your turn is up. Or you're at a doctor's office, or maybe even at the DMV, or a mechanic shop, or repair shop, waiting for your car, uh, and you're waiting to find out about the damages. You know, what? what is this going to cost me? So typically, in the waiting room, there's something important, something that we, we must get done, Uh, You find yourself there, stuck there, reading outdated magazines, looking at reruns of game shows. And and by the way, outside of the window, it's sunny, bright, all the important things of life that you could be doing, but yet you're stuck in the waiting room. But over the next couple of weeks, we're going to cover waiting room because many of us are facing that in this season of life right now, where we find ourselves struggling Uh, because we have our careers are on hold, or maybe you've experienced a layoff or a shutdown at your facility or job uh, that you work at and no longer having income. So you're waiting to see what comes next or how soon can I get my life restarted? For some of us, we're waiting for financial recovery, some type of financial relief, because we're waiting for our unemployment benefits to kick in. By the way, we're just waiting to get through unemployment. Uh, And yet we find ourselves waiting and that anxiety is increasing. For others, our kids are at home. We've been the teacher, mom, parent, everything, and learning new technology to support our kids. And yet we're just waiting for school to reopen. For some of us, we're waiting for test results to come back. For others, we're waiting to find out and hear about loved ones that have been admitted to hospitals because they're recovering from illness and we can't contact them because the hospitals have closed their doors to all visitors. And so we find ourselves waiting. And with the waiting comes anxiety, tension arise. And we ask the question, what can I do when there's nothing that I can really do? What, what do you do when there's nothing that you can do? And there's no good answer, there's no good options. The problems seemingly have no solution, but yet there's many questions. How can I move on? There are no answers 
to what's going on. And, and so how can I make it through? How can I move forward when I'm in a waiting room? Waiting. And if you're like me, I know I've been in a restaurant or I've been in uh, different places where I've been here waiting and somebody else comes in and they get served first or they get seated first and God knows then I'm really aggravated. I'm really questioning and, and questions going, is there something wrong with me? Am I invisible? <laughs> Do you see me here? Um, why aren't you helping me? Or is there something wrong with me? That's the first question I ask. And then if, if after I assess myself and conclude that, yeah, there, Peter, you're good. There's nothing wrong with you. There must be something wrong with them. And so if that's the case, I start to get really frustrated while I'm waiting. And for many of you, if you're like me, you're either going to run out, you're going to ban it and quit it all together, say, I don't got time for this. You're going to give up. Some of you turn to drinking. And, and many of you become jealous, angry, resentful. Whatever emotion that may be, it begins to arise. And so one of the things we wanted to do is to talk about that because it's so important right now because many of us are really asking the same question of God. God, where are you? What's going on? Are you angry with me? Or, or are you absent? Well, one of the things I want to tell you right up front, right now, is that God is not absent, he's not apathetic, and he's not angry. But yet, I have to struggle and try to resolve this tension within me because it certainly feels like it. And so over the next couple of weeks, we're going to be exploring this topic of the waiting room because many people, even in Jesus' day, and also in the Old Testament, People were experiencing God. God called them. God asked them to do something, and they found themselves in the waiting room. Some of Jesus's and God's favorite people found themselves in a waiting room asking the same question. God, where are you? Why aren't you here doing something right now? When are you going to intervene? Have you abandoned us? And so we want to tackle that question because I feel it's so relevant for many of the stories I've heard from many of you over the last couple of weeks on how to deal with and how should we show up? What can we expect when we're going through our waiting room experience? And so for this week, I want to explore Matthew's account of an incident that he observed as he was watching Jesus deal with a close friend of his. And he found himself waiting. This friend found himself waiting. And Jesus and Matthew are together observing what was going on. Let's take a look at Matthew, the 11th chapter, and we're going to start at the second verse. But before I go there, what I'd like to do is I would like to give you some background. See, Jesus is in Galilee, and he just finished telling his disciples how to do ministry. And now Jesus is going out to demonstrate how to do ministry. And as Jesus is going about his business, some of John the Baptist's followers catch up to Jesus to ask a question on behalf of John. So let's take a look at this here in Matthew, the 11th chapter and the second verse. It says, John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all the things the Messiah was doing. So John the Baptist the cousin of Jesus Christ, great friend of Jesus, found himself in prison. He finds himself in prison for doing exactly what God instructed him to do. He was ministering, preaching the gospel. In fact, he started preaching a little bit too much about the leaders of, the, of, of his day, and he found himself being taken and put in prison in a desert place. And yet, he's now waiting. In fact, he's waiting for almost a year in prison at this point when he send his disciples to Jesus. And he sends them and he asks the question, are you the Messiah we've been expecting? Or should we keep looking for another or for someone else? John, 
the Baptist. This is not John, the one we talked about over the last few weeks in the book of, who wrote the book of John. This is John the Baptist. He's sitting there questioning the very person and the identity of the person that he introduced to the world because he found himself waiting, waiting on what I'm, what's going to happen to me next, worried, his anxiety increasing. We hear this, but let me tell you before I move on how Jesus looked at John. This is Jesus' perspective of John the Baptist. Let's take a look at Matthew 11 and the 11th verse. It says, just as Jesus is talking, he says, I tell you the truth, of all who have ever lived, none is greater than John the Baptist. Look at that. <laughs> you mean, John is your favorite person, Jesus? Yeah, listen to me. None is greater than John the Baptist. Wait, wait, wait a minute, Jesus, what about your mother, Mary, you know, she has to be great. You, most people would say she's the greatest, right? You, they, you, we all adore our mothers. And Jesus goes, no, none is greater of everyone who has ever lived than John the Baptist. And now Matthew 4 and 12, when Jesus heard that John had been arrested, I want to just let you hear that right, amount, right there. Jesus, like I said, it's been a year before John sends his disciples in to ask Jesus this question. When Jesus had heard that John had been arrested, he left Judea and returned to Galilee. He went first to Nazareth, then left there and moved to Capernaum beside the Sea of Galilee. So basically, this is what happened. Jesus hears that, that John is arrested and he goes the opposite direction. He travels so far north, he actually goes to the sea and go, it seems like he's going to Cancun on vacation. That's basically, he says, because he went by the Sea of Galilee. He went to a seaside resort. Now, John is in the desert someplace else, way away from Jesus. Jesus travels in the opposite direction when he hears his favorite person is in need and is waiting and has been waiting there for almost a year now. Let's go on to Matthew 11 and 4. It says, so Jesus told him when, the, his, when John the Baptist's disciples come to him and say, are you the one or should we be looking for another? Jesus told them, go back to John and tell him what you have heard and seen. Does that sound familiar? We've just been talking about that over the last four weeks where we talked about that all of the disciples, all of the believers believed, not because they just had some hope in who Jesus was, but they had believed in Jesus because of what they had heard and what they saw. And here it is right again, Matthew's documenting. Matthew's an eyewitness documenting. This is what Jesus is telling people to do to believe in him. Watch what, he's, what they're hearing and what they're seeing. Let's go on. Matthew 11 and 5. So the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cured, and the deaf hear. The dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. So after a year, here it is, Jesus says, go tell John, this is the answer to your question, John, I'm doing great work for everybody else. I'm doing a whole bunch of stuff for everyone in, 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 around the country. I know you're waiting, John, but I chose to bring them in first. I, I, I'm doing ministry out here. Don't you see people are seeing? Don't you hear that, that the lame are walking? Don't you realize that people are returning back to the community? People are being productive. They're getting jobs now because they can be their able bodies now. They're, they're, don't you know people are being cured? The deaf are hearing, and, and, and people who were, were dead and, and separated from their family are now returning back to their families. There's good news, John. Things are happening. And many of you, 
Maybe sitting there saying, yeah, I know what that's like. Everybody else is going about life and they're loving life and they're, they, they don't have a problem over here. They, they're not in the situation I'm in. I'm stuck here in the waiting room and life is bustling and, and is busting at the seams outside and everybody's seem like they're enjoying things. And here, I'm stuck here in the desert place in pr- feeling like I'm in prison and I have nothing left to do. I don't even know what to do. I've ran out of all my options. But you hear about all the others that are being, that God is showing his favor upon. Jesus tells John's disciples to go tell him that. That's tough. That's tough. Let's go on. Matthew 11 and the sixth verse. I think Jesus says something so important here. He says this, blessed is anyone who does not stumble on my account. Literally, he's saying, happy is the one that doesn't get tripped up on or offended by or, is, or, or maybe uh, caused to have a downfall because or even caused to sin because of me, because of the shock of me not showing up and taking action on their behalf. Blessed is the person who sticks with me even when they don't see things are happen, even when they don't know that I'm working on their behalf. There's no tangible evidence that I'm showing up on their behalf. Blessed is him or her. Whew, that's powerful. Look at the implications of that. Because there's many times when I don't feel that God is working on my behalf. Look at many times I don't feel that God is is doing something and moving on my behalf or, or, or intervening. But yet, here it is, Jesus is saying, happy is that man or woman who maintains their faith in the face of my silence. They trust me no matter what. That's powerful because we're not trusting God because of the situation. We're trusting God because of who he is. It's the who, not the what. And this is what Jesus is saying. Blessed is anyone who does not stumble on account of me. In other words, he's saying, don't interpret God's silence as absence. Don't interpret God's quietness or his, the fact that you haven't seen anything yet as him being apathetic or angry with you. In your waiting room, I know it's easy for us to, to lose joy, to lose our hope and, and our sense of purpose. And, and we may even say to ourselves, I'll never be happy again. And, and I hope nothing, you know, I, I, and we may say, you know, when we're looking at hope, we can say there is no hope because nothing good will ever come from this. Or we may say, what is the purpose? You know, what's the point of continuing? But I want you to know that God has not abandoned you. He has not forgotten you. And your circumstances are just that. They're circumstances. It's just a situation. They are not proof of God's absence. There may be a purpose in your pain. There may be a purpose coming through your struggle. You may not even see it. You may not even get the benefit of seeing it. But I can tell you over my life, I've seen people look at me as I struggled through certain seasons in my life. And, and years later, come back and said, when you were going through this, I saw how you handled that. I didn't get the benefit of knowing it and seeing it. For, but at that moment, years later, I can hear someone say, I can remember when you were going through this. And I saw how you handled this. And it added to my faith. My faith is stronger because of it. And for others, there are things that I've gone through, and I, I don't even know if anyone have benefited from 
what I've gone through. I haven't seen the results of that. I haven't heard the results of it. But I got to trust that whatever it is that I'm going through during this waiting period, in this waiting room, that God is for me. He's not against. That God is on my side. David said it this way. He says to, to, to God when, when he was struggling and going through, he says, Lord, even when my spirit is broken and my heart is downtrodden. Lead me to a rock that is higher than I. In Psalm 61 and 2, he says, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. Lord God, get me up, raise me up, bring me up from just looking at my circumstances, at my situation, at my condition. Get me out of He says, help me rise above this. Help me change my mindset. Get a new perspective. Lord, help me change. Help me see things as you see things. See things from your perspective. Lead me to a rock that's higher than I. That's what David said. And I think that's what you, that's what I should be looking at as we're going through this season of waiting. God, I need to trust and know that you still hold the world in your hands. Not only the world, God, you hold my world in your hands. Our world is in your hands. And I trust you no matter what. In my waiting, I have to find and anchor myself in the who, not the what. In my waiting room, I have to trust God no matter what. Over the next few weeks, we're going to go a little bit deeper. We're going to dive a little bit deeper into this topic. So I'm encouraging you, call your friends, tune in next week as we explore and discuss how do we show up? How did God want us to show up when we're in the waiting room of life? For those that are struggling right now, I just want to pray with you. Father, in the name of Jesus, I thank you for your word today. I thank you that even when I don't see you, I know, I have confidence that you are working. Lord God, I know that there is anxiety that continues to riddle my mind and my thoughts. Lord God, lead me to a rock that's higher. Give me a perspective that is above what I'm seeing right now. Let me see things as you see things. Open my eyes to see the many people that you have already brought through illness and sickness and have delivered us on the other side, the millions of people. We're hearing about the 30 and the many thousands of people that are are passing away. But God, there are millions that have come through. Let me see that perspective and take courage and, and take faith and understand that you are for us, not against, that you are at work even when I don't see you working. Lord God, and give me the courage to help lend my faith, my strength to others. So when others are weak, that when they call me, that I don't just commiserate with them, but that I lift them up and I encourage them and let them know that there's a God that's still in control and that he has the world, he has our world, he has my world in his hands. Hand. And Lord, we're going to be so careful to give you all the praise, the glory, and the honor, regardless of the situation and circumstance. You deserve it because you are for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. God bless you today and may heaven smile upon you. 
Wasn't that an incredible message? Did it speak to you? Did you feel that? Did you feel that in your spirit? I felt it. I felt it. Thank you, Pastor Peter, for sharing that message with us. Now it's time for us to make sure that we apply it, right? We receive the word and then we apply it. So make sure you subscribe to our YouTube channel because guess what? On there you can watch previous sermons and catch all of our videos from our services on Sunday. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook to stay connected with us. We have a community there. We uplift each other, we encourage each other, and we hold each other accountable. So please be inspired this week, apply the word, and we look forward to seeing you at our next service.